Good afternoon. My name is Emily Blumberg, and I'm the president of the American Society of Transplantation. I'd like to welcome all of you to our first ever multi-society international webinar on COVID-19, Organ Donation and Transplant Town Hall. The webinar that you're about to partake in is one that has represents the very hard work of a large number of people, both organizers and presenters, who have been dedicated to trying to bring you the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 and its impact on transplantation. We all know that everyone on this call wants to do the best for all of our patients, trying to help them in real time with the latest innovations. And so what we've tried to do today is present information from around the world that we think will be useful to all of you. We know that this is being aimed at only specific societies, but in our interest to be totally transparent and to communicate fully with societies throughout the world, we will be making this available both to other members of your societies through your society web pages, as well as to any other societies that have interest in um, listening to this webinar after the fact. So please be able to assure your colleagues that this information will be available to everybody when it is completed today. With that in mind, and given the large amount of information we would like to convey to you in the next two hours, I'm going to turn this over to our first moderator. But before I do so, I'd like to show you the, so the societies that have been involved in this. And here you can see, I'd like to give a special thanks to members of AOPO, AST, ASTS, ESAT, ISHLT, NATCO, UNOS, and uh, the Transplantation Society for all of their hard work on this. Um, and if you go flip to the next slide, you'll be able to see all of our presenters and I mean our planning committee who have worked so hard on this particular um, webinar. So, and I apologize, I left out CST, my screen was partly blocked. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dipali Kumar, who will be presenting to you the first set of speakers. Also, in addition, there will be information in the handout area with today's agenda and list of speakers. We're also trying to keep you updated with resources that have been supplied by the organizers that may be of help to you and your institution, and that's all available in the handout area. Thank you. Dipali? Thanks, Emily. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Dipali Kumar. I'm a transplant infectious disease specialist at the University Health Network in Toronto. And uh, what we've done is divided the webinar into um, three or four sections. Um, the first section uh, will deal with presentation, treatment, and prevention of COVID-19. And um, I will introduce all the speakers. We have a number of speakers that will um, be going through this. Uh, Dr. Erica Lees is a transplant pulmonologist at the University of Washington. Um, she will be followed by Dr. Ajit LeMay, who is a transplant infectious disease specialist at the Uni University of Washington as well. Uh, we'll then have Attilio Iacovoni of the uh, Heart Transplantation Unit in Bergamo, Italy, followed by Paolo Grossi, Transplant ID at the University of Insubria in Italy. And finally, uh, we'll have uh, Marion Michaels, who is a pediatric transplant infectious disease at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, who will be discussing prevention. And then Lara danziger Isakoff who is Pediatric Transplant ID at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, after everyone has done their presentations, um, we'll be uh, doing a Q&A, uh, and uh, depending on the amount of time we have. So I will ask Dr. Lees to go ahead. Great, thank you. And thank you for having me here to talk with you all today. You can move forward the slide. Um, as was mentioned, I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle. Next slide, please. So 
so I'll be talking about the background and presentation of, of this viral uh, pneumonia illness. And so, as I'm sure most everybody knows, that there was a cluster of pneumonia cases that occurred in Wuhan, China in early December 2019. And it was ultimately identified and termed as a novel coronavirus infection, or 2019 and COVID. After more uh, research was done, it was uh, found to be an enveloped RNA beta coronavirus that was phylogenetically similar to SARS-CoV, which is a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, and so it was thus renamed as SARS-CoV-2. To be clear, COVID-19, which is, um, stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019, is the disease that is caused by the virus um, SARS-CoV-2. The infection um, spread quickly, and, and on March 11th, 2020, it was designated as a pandemic by the WHO. You can see here I included um, a map of the world uh, that really there's there's no area that has not been touched by this virus. And the um, numbers below I added actually on Friday, and I have updated numbers. This also comes from the WHO. Now, uh, since Friday, there are now 332,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus, of COVID-19, um, uh, more than 1,400, uh, sorry, 14,000 confirmed deaths in 190 countries, areas, or territories that are um, currently affected. Next slide, please. So we have a couple of reports uh, that are telling us about the presentation of COVID-19. The initial report uh, came out of the Wuhan China group um, and was published in JAMA. And they reported the most common symptoms being fever in 99%. You can see the, the um, cutout from their presentation or for them paper right there. Um, and dry cough in, in almost two thirds. A, about a third of patients had dyspnea. I do want to point out that those patients, the, the reports on these patients were from hospitalized patients, um, as is the second one that I'll review. So we don't have as much information about patients who may have more mild disease and what are their most common presenting symptoms. So the second report was published in uh, New England Journal. And uh, it was a larger report from China. Most of the patients were still the patients coming from Wuhan, but it also included other patients in China. They reported fever um, at presentation of 44%, but again, this being this was focused on patients who were hospitalized, um, nearly 90% of, of the patients ultimately developed fever during their hospitalization. They saw a cough that was somewhat similar, about 68%, um, although they did see about a third of patients had a productive cough, and they saw dyspnea in about 20%. Comorbidities have definitely been reported as being higher likelihood of developing COVID-19. Uh, these two papers ranged anywhere from 23 to 46%. And using um, the paper in New England Journal and then another paper that was published by uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, it appears that the incubation period, um, again, by the data that we have, appears to be four to five days, but can be up to 14 days. And as we know, patients can be completely asymptomatic as well. Slide. That's all that I have. Thank you. Ajit, we're ready for you. Uh, can you hear me? You we sure can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Could we go to the next slide, please? All right. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate. I think there's a lot of unknowns about how uh, SARS-CoV-2 will intersect and impact with organ transplantation. I think there's a reasonable expectation based on analogy with other uh, viruses in this setting that uh, our organ transplant patients uh, with their concomitant immunosuppression might be at increased risk potentially for acquiring the virus. Um, specifically through either behavioral or biological features such as those that are listed here. And I think there's a lot of concern that there may be a higher likelihood of progressing from infection to more severe disease, perhaps as a result of underlying comorbid uh, conditions as well as the impact of immune suppression. 
However, I will note that at least based on limited data with related coronaviruses, there wasn't necessarily an increased uh, morbidity or mortality above and beyond that that could be attributable to underlying uh, comorbidities. And unfortunately, to date, the, the published data specifically on organ transplant patients with COVID is very, very limited. So I'm going to share with you in the next slide uh, very preliminary data with our first five cases. Next slide, please. So I want to highlight a couple of important caveats as you look at these data, which literally could have been updated in the last few minutes since I've heard about a, a couple of additional cases. You'll notice that um, all of these cases are patients who are many years, more than 10 years, in some cases up to 20 plus years after transplant, and as a result, we're on low dose maintenance immunosuppression. Number two, when you look at these data, please keep in mind that uh, at the University of Washington with one of the first available on-site real-time testing laboratories, we were able to develop specific testing algorithms that called for testing all immunosuppressed patients with any signs or symptoms that could be compatible with COVID. And so that testing bias may also impact um, the cases that have been diagnosed to date. But as you can see, we've encountered organ transplants of all types, uh, patients who had significant underlying comorbidities that have previously been described to be associated with an increased risk of morbidity and mortality. Uh, the symptoms that you'll see for these five cases are quite similar to those that have been described in a general population, not necessarily immunosuppressed. And one thing we've been surprised with is just the range of clinical presentations from those mimicking a standard upper respiratory virus infection to one that was suggestive of viral pneumonia. And the actual uh, clinical care that uh, was undertaken for these patients was in the inpatient setting for three of the five, but two of the five had relatively mild symptoms and were managed expectantly in the outpatient setting. The treatments that were undertaken in the majority of patients was simply supportive care without specific changes to immunosuppression, and only one of the five patients, the patient with most severe symptoms leading to acute uh, kidney injury, uh, was hydroxychloroquine administered along with a discontinuation of baseline MMF and uh, the addition of prednisone. So far, with very, very short outcome, I want to emphasize uh, all of our patients are alive at now approximately a week or uh, greater into their clinical course, and so it raises at least the possibility that in patients who are very far out from transplant on low-dose immunosuppression, that perhaps the impact will be um, uh, reflective of their underlying comorbidities rather than necessarily an attributable impact of immunosuppression. Next slide, please. Atelia, we're ready for you. Atilio, we are ready for your presentation. Please continue when you're ready. Hey, Brian, from my perspective, it looks like we may have lost his line. All right, Dr. Kumar, um, we'll, we will advance the slides past Atilio's uh, slide presentation. Um, if you wish to comment on any of those, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, we will continue on and advance to the next session. Paula, we're ready for you. 
Yes, okay. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, share with you this uh, couple of slides. So if I may have the next slide. So my task is to briefly speak about uh, what are the treatment uh, options that we uh, currently have. Uh, and uh, the first uh, statement and that there is no approved drug for the treatment of patients with COVID-19, either for the general population and particularly for the solid organ transplant population. And the, the clinical management includes infection prevention and control and supportive care, including uh, supplementary oxygen, uh, non-invasive ventilation and mechanically ventilated support when indicated. So in my unit, uh, I have 30 beds, they are all with uh, COVID-19 uh, patient. Uh, hopefully none of them are transplant recipients, uh, but 50% of them are on CPAP or non-invasive ventilation because of severe interstitial pneumonia. And uh, what we started doing was using, uh, based on the uh, Chinese experience, lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, calitra, uh, but then uh, the, the Calitra is not any longer available uh, in Italy, so we switched to Darunavir, Ritonavir, or Darunavir, Kobichistat as an alternative. And uh, But there are no data to support this. This was just because we didn't have an alternative. And all these uh, antiretrovirals are used in combination with chloroquine that we don't have in Italy. We use hydroxychloroquine. And, uh, but recently, the, uh, the data that we have been published last Thursday on the New England Journal of Medicine from a, another power trial have shown limited efficacy of lopinavir, at least in the most severe patients. Apparently, there is some benefit if you start very early, but not very much when the disease is already there. And the remdesivir is a, an investigational intravenous drug that uh, inhibits uh, the, uh, 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 the viral replication through premature termination of RNA transcription and has in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2 has been developed for Ebola but then has been shown to be in vitro active against this uh, uh, new agent. And there are uh, currently several ongoing randomized controlled trials that aim to examine the efficacy and safety of uh, intravenous remdesivir for COVID-19. So 200 milligram and then 100 milligram per day IV. Next slide. And this is just a, a slide showing the figure of the, uh, uh, the improvement rate of patients treated uh, with, with severe uh, COVID-19 treated with lopinavir, ritonavir compared to control. And as you can see, there is actually no difference. So the conclusion of this trial that there's some intrinsic limitation are that this approach is not uh, so effective as we were hoping at the beginning of this uh, terrible epidemic. Next slide. And uh, uh, there is accumulating evidence that suggests that a subgroup of patients with severe COVID-19 might have a cytokine storm syndrome. And tocilizumab is a recombinant humanized anti-human monoclonal antibody directed against the uh, soluble and membrane-bound interleukin-6 receptor. And, and the drug as an intravenous and subcutaneous uh, formulation. And from my preliminary experience in non-transplant uh, recipients, because the drug, at least in, Ita in Italy, but also in Spain, uh, is not uh, allowed to be used in, in, the, in patients with immunosuppression, including solid organ transplant recipients. I don't know if this will be different uh, in the US or in other countries. Uh, but the, the preliminary results, so I, I treated uh, yesterday two patients who were on uh, non-invasive ventilation from a week with a very uh, slow uh, recovery or non-recovery, uh, and today they, they 
uh, went off uh, the, the non-invasive ventilation and they are just with some oxy oxygen supplementation. So it's just anecdotal, but in some cases with severe hyperinflammation, it seems to be really effective. Uh, the, the convalescent plasma that is, uh, has been used in China uh, is, is currently not recommended. There is uh, the survival and sepsis campaign uh, guidelines that have been just published a couple of days ago, and this is a statement that I've taken from that uh, guide is that is not recommended in treating patients with COVID-19 until more evidence is available. And there are many vaccines under development, but none is currently available. And I think that it will take months before we will have something that we can uh, use for preventing this uh, uh, infection in, in the general population and the solid organ transplant population. If I can go to the, my sli last slide, just to remind that uh, particularly the <clears throat> uh, uh, PI, the protease inhibitor, the antiretrovirus, have major drug-drug interaction with many immunosuppressive agents. So uh, the, the recommendation is to be very careful if you are going to use this drug in the solid organ transplant population because you may run into uh, overexposure of immunosuppression. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Atelia, we're going to try to go back to you. Um, so hang on, folks, just one minute. Are you there? Are you there? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, so I apologize. We're going to flip back to Marion. Hang on just one moment, please. Thank you so much. If you go to, um, I'm if you go to the next slide and just hit enter five times, four times, one more, one more after that. Thank you. This was the problem of doing uh, uh, the slides at home. At any rate, I, I thank you for allowing me to talk a little bit about uh, community and hospital preventive strategies, which I know many of us know already, but perhaps need to be emphasized again. Washing our hands while it sounds simple is really the mainstay of preventing transmission and proper hand hygiene of 20 seconds with soap and water or alcohol sanitizer after touching any item that has been touched by other individuals before touching one's face, nose, or eyes is critical. It's important to avoid secretions of other people. And as the picture of the, of the classic sneeze studies show, we really do need to maintain a distance of two meters or six feet. As a pediatrician, I always felt that teaching children hand hygiene and proper cough and sneeze etiquette was perhaps the most difficult. But as I have been observing my colleagues and my friends, I recognize that it is perhaps harder to educate older individuals who their entire life have been coughing and sneezing into their own hands. So I really feel like it needs to be uh, uh, emphasized again and again to cough or sneeze into a tissue and throw it away, not put it in your pocket, or to cough into the crook of your arm if there is not one available. Self-quarantining is really important for our families and for our healthcare workers as soon as we get sick, rather than trying to simply power through as we can be the transmitters to others, as perhaps shown on the slide that uh, Dr. Ajit LeMay showed earlier with two of their patients had acquired their infection while in the, in the hospital institution. Um, <clears throat> if there are symptoms, they should even try to be quarantined from their families, eating in their own bedrooms, using a separate bathroom if available, and cleaning and disinfecting the areas that have uh, shared areas. Societal quarantining with staying at home as much as possible is quite important, particularly for our transplant patients. 
and decreasing the number of people with whom our transplant patients interact. And does it work? Will the early data uh, that came out of the Wuhan district of China suggest that it may or does? Uh, Dr. Zhang Li Ren and colleagues showed a low incidence, much lower than what would have been, been anticipated for their 87 heart transplant recipients in the descriptive survey that comes out today from the uh, Journal of Heart Lung Transplantation, showing that the majority of their patients did practice enhanced precautions of self-quarantining and that this may have impacted the decrease in disease transmission to them. If we could go to the next slide. Preventive strategies within the hospital, and again, if you could hit it three, four more times, um, I think even once more or twice more. Fabulous, thank you. So sick patients, um, if you should be instructed to call the institution before they are coming in, so that we can know that they are coming pre-arrival, assess them and mask them quickly and isolate them. For proven patients or those that are persons of interest, negative pressure rooms if available and neutral rooms if not available are important. Again, limitation of people going into the rooms of proven cases or persons of interest. Personal protective um, equipment is critical, having masks, gown, gloves and eye protection. And of course, we are finding all too frequently that we are running into shortages with this. In those institutions that have the capability, even having an observer of, to watch people putting on their personal protective equipment so that it is shown to be appropriately done is helpful. Um, saving the fitted respirator mask for aerosol generating procedures and not throwing them away, but uh, having, um, having uh, protocols and policies available for how to reuse for those individual patients. Cohorting patients is going to have to vary by institutional variability in your access to rooms, but trying to have them away from the transplant patients uh, that are not infected is important and will be discussed in more detail by Dr. Humar uh, later on. And again, hand washing frequently. The concept of should our patients be coming to appointments, I think has to be taken by case by case. One should think about whether or not this is just a screening appointment or one where there is a concern for them having rejection. Consider masking them when they get into the hospital, even if they are not sick, and having them ushered into a room to avoid touching uh, areas that may have been touched by other people. Using teleconferencing will again be discussed later in this, in this town hall, uh, but is something that it, each institution should look into uh, to not have patients come unnecessarily into the institution where they may come in contact uh, with infection. And again, hand washing frequently, and I will stop there. Thank you very much. Laura, uh, it looks like you have self muted. I'm unmuted, thank you. Okay, great. Go to the next slide. Fortunately, we have uh, some data from pediatrics, I, although it is quite limited. The majority of this data has come from China and initially indicated that less than 1% of the cases which were presenting to the hospitals were, um, were in children younger than 10 years of age. I think it's important to note that this information on this slide represents information in hospitalized children, both in Wuhan and the surrounding provinces, where the proportion of patients who were positive for SARS-CoV-2 ranged between 1.6 and 12.3%. The ages ranged from one day up to 15 years, and the majority of patients had fever. The patients who became critically ill all 
uh, at one institution at Wuhan's Children's Hospital all had significant comorbidities. And to, it, to date in that population, there was only one death reported in a 10-month-old that had a comorbid condition with complicated indisception. Neither of these institutions reported any transplant patients um, among those who were positive. Next slide. Since those initial reports, there's been a, a large report published last week in the, in the journal Pediatrics um, of 2143 children who had COVID-19. 34.1% of them were laboratory confirmed and the rest were presumed based on epidemiology. Again, the median age of these children were seven, was seven. And most interestingly, younger children and infants were more likely to have severe disease with up to 10% of children under the age of one year having severe disease reported, and only 3% of those 16 and over with severe disease. Again, no transplant patients have been noted in this, in this cohort either. I think it's also important to remember in this population that we're seeing increasing reports, both from China as well from other regions, that pediatric patients may be more likely to be co-infected with other respiratory viral infections, and that the presence of influenza, human metanumavirus, RSV, or parainfluenza virus does not exclude necessarily a patient from being co-infected with SARS-CoV. Fortunately, to date though, pediatric patients have fared much better than adult patients, although we need to be vigilant and we are looking for people to actively report their patients should they become positive. Thank you. Erica, I just received a message that we're, uh, we possibly have uh, Attilio back on the line. Um, we're gonna try to unmute him and see whether or not we can hear him at this point in time. Attilio, can you hear us? Can Hello, you... can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent, excellent. Oh, okay. We're going to back, we're gonna backtrack to your slides right now, Atilio. Uh, attendees, okay, we great. apologize for the momentary inconvenience. And uh, no, it's Atilio, okay. We'll begin in a moment. Okay. okay. Fantastic. First of all, thanks for your consideration. As you know, here in Bergamo, we had an, and we still have an explosion of COVID COVID nineteen patients. In addition, because we are a transplant hospital, we had also uh, cases of COVID-19 as transplant patients. And um, in total, we have observed uh, 14 patients, but we present only the ones with the longer follow-up, six patients. Uh, among them, we lost two patients. Two patients are still in hospital, one stable, another unstable, and we have two outpatients. Next slide, please. Okay, let's start with the beauty. The first patient is a male, 15 years old, four months post her transplantations. He was on mencophenolate, cyclosporine, and 50 milligrams of steroids. He started to complain of fear, dry cough, but not dyspnea, and after three days we decided to test him and was positive. At this time, the lab tests were normal. We just observed a slight increase of CPR and the oxygen saturation was perfectly normal with no respiratory distress. So our strategy in this case was to stop mycophenolate and follow him by phone. And now after 14 days, I call him today, the patient is asymptomatic. The second patient is a very interesting one. is a 16, four years old male, uh, four months post her transplantation, was transplanted from an aggressive form of wild type amyloidosis cardiomyopathy. He had renal failure after transplantation and other problems, but he recovered all his complications quite well. Um, he's in cyclosporine and mTOR inhibitors. When we decided to discharge him to a dialysis South Clinic, uh, for this reason, we test him and it was positive. So at this time, he was completely asymptomatic. And uh, our strategy in this case was just to wait and see. So I think the key message of this slides, uh, we think that it's possible to have a very mild form of COVID-19, also in transplant patients, but we believe maybe that this is the exception that proved the rule. So next slide, please. Now let's speak about our inpatient experience. The first patient is a male, 66 years old, three months post-op, 
it was transplanted after 25 days of ECMO. So he had a lot of complications, but he recovered quite well. And uh, it was in cyclosporin and mTOR inhibitors. We test M before the charge in to rehabilitation, and uh, it was positive. So uh, the day after the test, he uh, started to have fear, cough, and uh, um, the oxygen saturation was slightly reduced. So our strategy in this case was to stop Everolimus, and we tracked him according to our hospital protocol that uh, at this time was uh, uh, an antiviral agent, uh, Keltra, azithromycin, uh, hydrochloroquine. But to be honest, now we have stopped uh, Keltra because uh, it's a nightmare also with interaction with uh, um, cyclosporine. We didn't notice any benefits. So the patient now is uh, stable, but still in oxygen marks. The second patient is a female patient, four years post her transplantation. She was uh, on cyclosporine mycophenolate. He started to have uh, fear and dry cough. And after five days, he had developing worse symptoms. So for this reason, he was admitted to the hospital with respiratory distress. She was positive. Again, we test him for COVID-19 infection. So in this case, our strategy was to stop mycophenolate. We start our hospital protocol and she requires CPAP treatment, but now she's in really in critical conditions. So the key message of this slide, I think, is that in COVID-19 is a very aggressive in immunosuppressive patients, and the patient could deteriorate very easy. So uh, it could be reasonable to reduce as much as you can immunosuppressive treatment. So next slide, please. Okay. Finally, the last two patients, the one which we have lost, the first one is a male patient, five years post her transplantation, uh, six years old. He was in azathioprine um, uh, and cyclosporine. The first, uh, in the first, first symptoms were fear and cough, and, but he came to the hospital late after seven days in very critical conditions. The saturation was, was very low and uh, we lost him after 10 days. The second case that is uh, quite interesting because it is, uh, was a lovely lady of 74 years old, 29 years after transplantations. He was on cyclosporin, everolimus, and mycophenolate. He was admitted before a COVID-19 outbreak in our hospital on 15th of the, uh, January for a severe episode of heart failure due to antibody mediated rejection. So we treat her with from four cycle of plasmapheresis. Uh, rituximab, and she developed uh, uh, COVID-19 infection after the second dose, uh, dose of rituximab. And unfortunately, she, she died after five days. So I think the key message in this case is that if you have an outbreak of COVID-19 in your hospital, think twice before to treat any patient with high immunosuppressive regime. And thank you for your attention. Attendees, thank you for your patience. We're just advancing the slides to the next section. Thank you. Uh, DePauli, if you want to go ahead, please do. To Polly, it looks like you're muted from your side. To Polly, are you there? Erica, Depali is shown as uh, available in chat. Uh, Depali, uh, appears that you're muted on your side.
the poly the poly are you there looks like we don't have her audio so do you want to move on to lloyd uh yes please let's move on to dr redner okay Okay, Dr. Ratner, it's your turn. Great, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lloyd Ratner. I'm a transplant surgeon at Columbia University in the city of New York, where we are now undergoing a huge surge of uh, COVID-19 patients, and it's, it's really pretty scary. Uh, I'm also the president of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, and uh, I'd like to just start by you know, uh, expressing my gratitude to uh, to Emily Blumberg and the AST staff and the AST community of practice for uh, really doing the lion's share of the work of, of uh, putting this together, and also for all the the, uh, the the speakers and moderators who have participated in this. It's really been uh, this has been put together in a relatively short period of time, so. Kudos to all those involved. Uh, this portion of the webinar, we're going to talk about getting to transplant, donor issues, and candidate concerns. And we have five speakers, and I'll introduce them now and then let them do their thing successively. Our first speaker is Mike Isom, who probably needs no introduction, but he's a uh, transplant infectious disease doctor at Northwestern University in Chicago. Our second speaker will be Dr. Ajit Limay, who is also an infectious disease doctor at the University of Wisconsin. Our third speaker will be uh, Kevin O'Connor, who's the president and CEO of the Life Center Northwest, which is the, uh, the uh, organ procurement organization that serves the uh, North, the uh, the Northwest portion of the United States. Our fourth speaker will be Kelly Ranham, who's the CEO of the Louisiana Organ Procurement Organization. And she's also currently the AOPO president. And our fifth speaker will be Dr. Luciano Potina from the University of Bologna, who is associated with the cardiac transplant program there. So with that, let's move on to Mike uh, Isom's presentation, please. Great. Thanks, uh, and thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to present today. I do have some relevant disclosures. I'm a paid member of uh, the Medical Advisory Board of uh, Viracor, which is doing uh, coronavirus uh, testing, including for some OPOs, and I'm the current chair of the uh, NIH uh, DMID Adaptive Trial for Treatments uh, for COVID-19. Next slide. So what I was asked to talk about uh, today uh, is a little bit about uh, diagnostics and testing, and uh, specifically since it's in this uh, organ donation uh, realm, uh, data for its use there. The, the second part is actually pretty easy because there's very limited data that I've seen in terms of its uh, utility in that setting. So I'll just uh, be able to present to you uh, some information uh, that we have uh, from other data sets. Um, as far as diagnostics are, are concerned, for the most part, we are always talking about uh, PCR-based assays uh, for much of the world. There are some areas that have uh, 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 rapid antigen-type uh, kits as well as uh, antibody-based uh, kits, which will be coming along uh, uh, very shortly and uh, with FDA approval in the United States. Um, uh, for donor screening, though, PCR testing uh, is uh, the one that's uh, most available. Um, it's available uh, at uh, a number of different hospitals and commercial labs, uh, and I left the uh, FDA website where you can find the up-to-date list of uh, testing uh, sites. Uh, there are some limitations uh, to testing at this point. Um, there are variable availability of swabs, viral transport media, as well as availability of uh, the actual assays, and in many cases, uh, challenges uh, with turnaround time. Um, at our center, for example, those uh, tests that are done in-house, uh, which is currently uh, just shy of 100 tests per day, uh, we can get turnaround in about six hours, but for our ambulatory patients where it's sent to a reference lab, it's taking anywhere from one to three days to get the results back. 
The second question uh, that oftentimes come up is what is the false negative result? There's been a wide range of uh, uh, rates that have been reported in the literature, anywhere from around 2% to 22%. Um, this is likely uh, very much dependent on uh, how the sample is collected. Uh, does someone get uh, a deep uh, collection uh, in the or, uh, nasal pharynx? Um, uh, is there good quality collection? Are patients early or late in the disease uh, where uh, utility of the uh, PCR-based test because of a relatively low viral load uh, maybe uh, less. Uh, the sample site, so whether you're talking about upper or lower tract uh, uh, diseases, we'll talk about in a second, uh, as well as challenges potentially with lab assays or reagent uh, errors. Um, uh, the other uh, issue is where you're doing the test. Uh, we still have relatively limited data, um, but from what has been published by, by from the study uh, from China, um, the sensitivity of uh, uh, BAL fluid is 93%, uh, nasal swabs 63%, uh, and then uh, nasopharyngeal swabs of 32. So depending on where you get the susceptible the, the testing, uh, you may get uh, a lower yields if you're uh, sampling the upper versus the lower respiratory tract. Um, again, these results are generally in patients that are relatively sick. I know we here at Northwestern have seen at least two patients with the severe lower tract disease where the uh, nasal swap was negative and the uh, lower tract was positive. Next slide. The uh, other thing which everyone is uh, quite familiar with, this is a little outdated. Uh, uh, the U.S. number is up to about 250,000 uh, tests that have been performed. Uh, but uh, the, the, one of the biggest challenges currently is uh, local testing availability. Uh, many sites are, are doing some hybrid of uh, local testing uh, and send out testing. Next uh, slide. Um, in terms of uh, who to test, so th this is uh, taken in part, and I'll probably turn it over to Ajit, um, uh, from what uh, guidance that they've provided about who to screen uh, from the uh, post-transplant side. Since we're talking about donor testing, I think uh, really it depends on uh, taking into consideration what uh, your OPO has available to you and what the uh, turnaround time uh, has been. I know ROPO recently started uh, doing testing. Uh, there, it is sent to a reference lab uh, with uh, results generally uh, relatively quickly, although uh, uh, maybe uh, longer than uh, 12 hours. Um, uh, and so I think this is an area where we're gonna need a lot more data uh, for understanding the uh, risk uh, of uh, false negatives in terms of how many patients test negative and uh, end up having disease transmitted to uh, recipients. Uh, and then uh, what is the yield uh, of this uh, in screening for uh, patients versus uh, loss of organs because of false positives. That's all that I have. Uh, thank you. Ajit, you should be ready to go. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm back. Uh, despite rumors to the contrary, I am still at the University of Washington, that W and not Wisconsin. All right. I've been asked to just cover uh, donor management strategies, but really what I'm going to focus in on uh, in the next slide, please, is a framework for thinking about um, decisions, difficult decisions, about whether to continue organ transplantation at your center. And obviously this is a huge topic given the concerns that people have um, related to multiple aspects of, of transplantation, including some of the concerning clinical data shared by our Italian colleagues. And so this just provides some of the framework that we had in mind in thinking about our own transplant center's decision for at least now to continue with organ transplantation. And listed on the top two columns are uh, arguments in favor of maintaining um, the ability to, to uh, continue organ transplants, as well as on the other side, arguments against um, uh, continuing transplantation. And the various domains that we thought through included some of the clinical aspects of transplantation, the impacts and ripple effects that go far beyond just the organ transplant population, particularly with constrained resources, with large numbers of patients in the community being admitted, financial considerations, legal considerations, and then finally, very importantly, ethical and moral obligations to patients who we list at our center 
for transplantation if we can do it safely. And at least for the present time, which is certainly subject to change as the situation changes, we have decided to continue um, uh, performing organ transplantation uh, except in our living donor programs. And again, this is a fluid, dynamic situation that may well change if, for example, we don't have enough PPE or other kinds of things. But one of the clinical factors that we thought about is since much of the concern about what the impact that COVID would have uh, specifically in our organ transplant populations, we considered what would happen to our patients if they did not receive a life-saving transplant including very high mortality rates for some of our sicker patients awaiting, for example, lung, liver, or heart transplants, and the fact that if we deferred transplantation, they would likely remain at risk through their multiple hospital and medical center uh, contacts and, and potential risks of nosocomial infection. So I think each center should carefully consider um, whether or not to continue with transplantation, and this, again, provides just one uh, conceptual framework for thinking about what might go into that decision. Next slide, please. One of the major concerns about transplantation, obviously uh, a number of factors as shown in the previous slide, but is can we transmit SARS-CoV-2 from the donor to the recipient, and I think really we don't have a definitive answer for that, and so this provides, at least through a critical literature review, um, what available data there are that either suggest the possibility of transmission uh, on the left side and the arguments against or data um, suggesting that transmission may not occur, at least to certain non-lung, non-GI organs. I think the data published from uh, Wuhan and Chinese investigators have pretty clearly shown that um, both viable virus, culturable viruses present in stool, and there is obviously as the major target organ, the lung, uh, a high level of concern about transmission in an uh, unknowingly infected uh, donor. However, our estimation based on the available data to date and drawing from analogies from what we know about other RNA respiratory viruses, including some close cousins of SARS-CoV-2, namely MERS and uh, SARS from 2003, that the risk for transmission of active infection from a donor may vary significantly when one considers GI uh, tract-related organs and lung organs versus non-lung organs, and I think that should be kept in consideration, particularly in the discussions about access to testing for donors that Dr. Eisen uh, had just alluded to. All right, next slide, please. Okay, great, thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you for this opportunity um, to review some of the donor strategies. Um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the testing. I think that's been well covered by Dr. Zeissen and Dr. LeMay. Um, I am gonna spend some time talking about maybe five or six things that I think all of us working on the organ donation side can anticipate and should be prepared for. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to just give an overview of, of the general approach that we're taking to the screening of potential organ donors. Um, all of OPOs in the United States and elsewhere are striving to balance their uh, ability to carry out their mission and provide, maximize the number of organs available to the transplant community with efforts to mitigate the risk of disease transmission, obviously for patients, for the healthcare team, for OPO staff and for recovery surgeons. So we're all uh, in the same boat uh, in that regard. Our routine screening now across the country includes the, um, the Uniform uh, Donor Risk Assessment Interview, which includes uh, qu specific questions related to medical, behavioral, travel, social history that would be uh, potentially suggestive of, of uh, increased risk of exposure uh, to, uh, to the virus. Um, we ask specific questions about whether or not there has been any history of signs or symptoms, such as a fever, cough, shortness of breath, or 
evidence of lower respiratory tract disease. Um, and of course, look at the epidemiologic risk factors related to recent travel in particular. And also uh, ask specific questions now as part of this uniform donor risk assessment interview related to whether or not there's been a, a risk of exposure to a person under investigation for being infected with uh, with this virus. We also, um, uh, in, in many parts of the country and some OPOs routinely now are doing chest CTs to uh, determine whether or not there are CT findings that might be consistent with or are, are suggestive of uh, exposure to the virus uh, in addition to the, uh, the the test results that we're obtaining. And of course, that's going to be to some extent a function of uh, where in the disease progression we're doing the, uh, the, the CT. Um, uh, and that's going to vary from case to case. As far as the testing goes, I think the one of the uh, current challenges we're faced with is, is that most of us, I believe, are leaning towards trying to do universal or routine testing on all potential organ donors. But there are challenges for many OPOs. They don't have access to a testing platform locally. Um, and in some cases, uh, they need to send specimens uh, uh, across quite a distance, uh, which then can translate into several days of waiting time for the turnaround for the result to be available to them. So while we're not there yet uh, in the United States where every OPO is universally testing every potential organ donor, I think it's safe to say that we're rapidly moving in that direction. Um, some of us, uh, like here in Seattle, are lucky enough to have the local uh, testing facility. We're working closely with Dr. LeMay and his team, and I want to uh, just acknowledge uh, Dr. LeMay for his uh, leadership and his uh, willingness to partner closely with the OPO uh, in this instance uh, so that both the University of Washington Medical Center Transplant Program and uh, Life Center Northwest as the local OPO are working hand in glove to make sure that we're maximizing every opportunity for donation and transplantation by making uh, testing available to us, not only available to us locally, but also prioritizing uh, our testing so that those results are turned around to us generally in less than 18 hours. Um, there's already been a discussion about the, the various types of specimens. I think the only comment I would add there is that um, we do the, we have the uh, hospital staff, the healthcare team in the hospital obtain the specimens for us. And then we do the testing um, outside of the of the normal internal uh, testing protocol of each of our donor hospitals, and so that um, that helps sort of um, um, protect against uh, concerns that otherwise the hospital might have when, uh, if they're doing testing on an inpatient, they would have to put that patient in isolation and that sort of thing. So we found that to be a useful um, way to uh, get around that particular challenge. Um, as far as the as the um, things that I think. Uh, we would like to share with the rest of the OPOs based on our uh, experience with uh, more of an early surge uh, of this uh, virus here in the Northwest is that you uh, can and should expect there will be eventually shortages of, of PPE. We've already heard some comments along those lines. Uh, we're seeing some extreme shortages of PPE in our hospitals now. So we've actually created an, uh, kits uh, for our staff to take on site with them. And we've uh, we've sent those to all of our uh, coordinators and all of our staff who are going to be spending time in the hospital, um, so they can bring in their own masks, their own gloves, their own gowns, as needed. Uh, we're and and so that's something that is, uh, I think would would make sense for others to begin to prepare for. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in restrictions of access uh, to our hospitals, so we try very much to limit the number of staff who are actually entering the hospital at any point in time, and we're using a remote uh, communication technology like telephone or Skype or FaceTime or other technologies to the extent that we can uh, to minimize the uh, number of staff from the OPO who are present in the hospital. That being said, obviously, uh, when and if we need to have people at the bedside or in the operating room, uh, we're not uh, in any way um, minimizing that presence. But otherwise, we're just trying to do the right thing. Uh, the third thing I think we can anticipate is that travel restrictions. I know I read recently um, in the New York City area now the staff are actually being stopped uh, on the roads and that sort of thing to with, uh, 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 with inquiries as to where they're traveling to. And I think uh, providing our staff with um, some documentation uh, of the nature of the life-saving work they're involved with is uh, prudent and will be helpful going forward as more and more of us are encountering these types of restrictions. The other restrictions that we're seeing, especially up in this part of the country now, are restrictions placed by state governments, um, alerts from the governor's offices, and uh, mandates regarding uh, what medical procedures should be uh, suspended. 
So uh, what we've done, what we're doing is reaching out directly to our uh, state governments and state departments of health uh, to get their support in writing for our staff. Um, CMS has, has categorized uh, transplant surgery uh, as a tier 3B uh, procedure, which is a do not postpone category. And we're making sure our staff are, are prepared with uh, that documentation so that uh, when uh, hospitals begin to question uh, whether or not donation is a is a um, critical, essential medical procedure, we're able to um, support ourselves and move things along. Um, another another thing to be, bear in mind is that um, hospitals are restricting are restricting who can enter, um, and so we have are trying to to the greatest extent possible provide uh, local recovery staff for organs that are going to be sent out of our DSA, and I know this is happening elsewhere around the country more and more. Um, but I think uh, as we continue forward into the in this situation, we're going to need to rely more heavily on having our local recovery teams recover organs and send them to distant centers. And lastly, um, there's increasing pressure from our hospitals to move our cases along more rapidly. Uh, there's obviously growing competition for ventilators and for ICU beds. And so I think we should be anticipating and preparing for uh, being able to move the donation process along uh, as quickly as possible uh, while balancing the need to do the appropriate testing and the appropriate evaluation and place the maximum number of organs. So again, that's uh, all I have for now. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I won't add much more, but um, can you hear me? Yes, we can, uh, Kelly. Okay, great. Those of us with uh, donor care centers are uh, working uh, rapidly with our hospitals to transfer those patients once authorization occurs uh, to the donor care centers. Uh, we are seeing um, a few more uh, issues with DCD because of the vent shortages, uh, OR shutdowns, and the time constraints that Kevin addressed as well. Um, and I think that really just kind of minimizing our staff exposure, using telemedicine when, when um, able, huddling with the staff that way, trying to, to just decrease the burden on the hospitals is, is what the OPOs are, are working towards. So that's all I have to add to Kevin. All right, thank you. We'll advance to the next portion. Um, if that is the end of the section, I believe we'll unmute Dr. Ratner or, oh, looks like we have one more section, Luciano, my apologies. Um, hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for uh, putting this uh, together. And um, I will be happy to present uh, the protocol we are trying to implement in Bologna to address the issue of managing the candidates uh, during these uh, COVID uh, outbreaks. So please, the, the next slide. So um, as, as also has been anticipated earlier, uh, um, to uh, start thinking about uh, how to manage a, a transplant program and in particular uh, heart transplant program mm -hmm. lung transplant program in, in your hospital you should start uh, to put to take yourself uh, some questions so the first is if you have a covid free path in the hospital uh, if you have screening facilities for the donor we we have heard uh, that uh, in, in us opos are able to in in multiple cases to to have uh, screening facilities for the donor in Italy, we started to screen all the donors uh, by the end of February with a, a PCR in the BAL and now also with CT scan. Uh, also, it's important to consider how prevalent is the SARS-COVID uh, in the uh, recipient area, because if the recipient is coming from a, a very high prevalent area or not, how sick is the recipient? Because we have to weigh uh, how is really life-saving that potential donor for that potential recipient and if we have the possibility to screen the recipient because we need to consider how to uh, rule out uh, the possibility of having of having a covid in our recipient also take into consideration that if we live in a, a high prevalent area 
of COVID in just for instance to make you the case in uh, uh, in my area currently we have a prevalence of one case every 500 people one confirmed case is every 500 people considering that the uh, PCR is done only in symptomatic patients so we may have one case one person out of 100 patient 100 subject that can be affected in our area currently so it's quite highly prevalent so it's important to screen the patients knowing that we cannot rule out completely that is covid free so the next one please so we need to balance the risk of transplanting a covid recipient and the risk of a covid transmission in the post operative period with the risk of the patient to risk the transplant so this is uh, how and this is of, often is a gamble so how covid free is my icu how can i ensure to my recipient to skip to avoid the possibility to get the infection in the early post transplant post -trans transplant phase another alternative is do we really have alternative for example if we have covid free path considering using an LVAD for heart transplant recipient may be an option uh, only because we don't have immunosuppression but again we don't have data on LVAD patients infected by COVID and on the other hand another important issue is to consider to accept only good organs to minimize the risk of early graft dysfunction and long ICU stay. Uh, we have uh, been discussing a lot in the community, in the heart transplant community in particular, the acceptance of marginal organs. In this case, uh, in during a COVID outbreak with the uh, uh, ICU shortage of staff, I think it's not a good idea to accept a marginal organ with an anticipated long ICU stay. So we should focus, if we really want to, to go on with the transplant program on, on very good, very good organs. Uh, next one. This is my uh, last slide and very briefly, uh, you, you can screenshot it uh, very briefly is uh, the the protocol we have for the screening uh, uh, of our potential recipient for heart or lung uh, transplantation basically if we have the recipient that is already in hospital and is in on high urgency we uh, uh, um, periodically screen the patient with a ct scan and with swab if both are negative uh, he is on the waiting list. If one of the two is not negative, we withhold the patients from the waiting list. Uh, it can be more complicated if we uh, consider a patient arriving from home. So first of all, we have to uh, do uh, uh, we have to perform a phone triage of the patient to screen and to and to write a note of the screening. It's important to have a document of the screening to check for fever if the patients had or had, had or had not any upper respiratory symptoms uh, in the preceding two weeks. Uh, and if the patients had, we would not proceed with transplant to re-evaluate re the patient. If he declared he didn't have, we uh, accept the patient with face mask entering the hospital. We again rescreen for fever and upper uh, trait infection upon admittance. If no, if everything is clear, we perform a CT scan uh, to, to look for interstitial pneumonia. Uh, we uh, decided to go for TC CT scan screening because the turnaround time for a, a swab is still too long in our hospital. We are now taking a fast uh, PCR screening, but this fast PCR screening uh, they have a faster turnaround time, but they may, they may be uh, less sensitive in non-symptomatic patients. So our idea and our recommendation would be to do the CT scan anyway, and then if you have a rapid uh, a rapid uh, uh, PCR technique, you can use the rapid PCR techniques, and then to proceed for transplant. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you to the presenters. I actually have a couple of questions because this is really, we're really in the meat of what 
you know, the information that we've been getting from our state and local and authorities and our hospitals and all, um, this is really, that's been less specific. This is more specific to transplant. So first, let me ask, pose a question to Mike. Um, what is going on with the, with uh, the risk of uh, transmission through blood transfusions or how's the, the screening for blood donors and what's the blood availability uh, impact of, uh, of the, the coronavirus? So what I would say is the biggest impact is likely uh, not so much the uh, impact of uh, donor-derived uh, 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 coronavirus through blood, but absolute availability of blood. I know in our area, we're in critically critical shortage of platelets, for example, uh, because people are just not going for uh, to donate uh, blood and blood products. And so I think that this is something that all transplant centers need to probably have open dialogue with their blood banks uh, to just assess uh, for ongoing availability. In terms of uh, a relative risk, I think as Ajit pointed out, we don't have a lot of data uh, on uh, risk of transmission. Blood screening and deferral is very different um, from uh, uh, organ transplantation in that uh, blood and products uh, collected for blood, oftentimes uh, retained for a short period of time, uh, 24 hours or such, uh, to make sure that the patient is uh, without symptoms while other tests are ongoing. Um, for example, we had uh, one instance uh, where a patient uh, donated blood and the following day uh, became ill uh, and tested positive for coronavirus. So that uh, blood product was uh, uh, quarantined and disposed of. Um, so it's a bit of a different uh, 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 level of risk from uh, blood uh, donation. Uh, and we really don't have uh, uh, good data on uh, frequency of uh, transmission of these viruses. I think that uh, respiratory viruses oftentimes don't have uh, significant uh, viremia for seasonal viruses, uh, so the risk is very low. The frequency of uh, viremia or RNAemia uh, in uh, these uh, patients when they're severely ill is relatively infrequent. We have very little data on patients that have uh, mild or asymptomatic disease to really inform that uh, spot. Thank you. Let me ask a, a question to Ajit. Um, so in our in New York, we're just undergoing, we're beginning of the surge. And at our center, it looks like there may be a couple of patients who have, uh, were inpatients and, and uh, on the transplant service and then got exposed nosocomially and now have tested positive. Uh, what are your recommendations in terms of best practices to avoid nosocomial infections? Uh, Lloyd, it looks like Ajit might be self-muted right now. Ajit, can you hear us? If hear you. Yes, I hopefully I'm unmuted now. You are um, correct. You raised a good question, Dr. Ratner, and I think Dr. Michaels brought up some of the strategies that hospitals have used from, you know, adhering to recommended CDC uh, guidance about infection prevention. Our hospital has gone to a, um, a cohort strategy, at least for some patients, where there's a separate ward with patients who have tested uh, positive uh, for COVID. Um, you know, it is concerning that you're describing what sounds like nosocomial transmission. We have not, to our knowledge, have had patients acquire COVID while in the hospital. Um, and I'm somewhat encouraged by the Singapore and Taiwan experience, at least initially, that with very rigorous uh, infection prevention measures, that they were able to control at least transmission within the nosocomial setting. The community setting is completely different. So our general approach is in any patient as described by Dr. Potena that is suspected of possibly being symptomatic who is uh, getting ready to go to transplant, they would be screened. And anyone who has either laboratory or other clinical suspicion um, for COVID would not uh, be able to undergo transplant unless that's uh, adequately excluded, both by clinical symptoms, epi risks, laboratory testing, CT scan. Great, thank you. And in the interest of time, let me just pose one last question to, to uh, Kevin. Uh, uh, when the 
standard questions are asked of the donors. Is there a standard way that it's reported in the in donor net? Because at three in the morning, I haven't been able to find that so easily. Yeah, I I I know that we are recording it in our in our uh, OPO EMR, and I I think that my recommendation would be that I I'm sure that every OPO is asking those specific questions. My recommendation would be that if you're uh, entertaining an offer, is that you contact the OPO if you are unable to find the answers to those questions because they will have those answers for you. My my recommendation would be to you know is to make standard fields for those questions just like you have for serologies. I think it would be very useful for those of us who are accepting the organ offers. So uh, I know that uh, Depali wanted to ask some questions of her panelists uh, from her section and then we'll move on. Hi, it's Depali. Can you hear me now? We can, Depali. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay. So uh, I just want to go back to when we were talking about the uh, infected transplant recipients. And uh, this is a question for, um, for Ajit. Ajit, do you have a, any general idea of whether the patients that we're seeing in the transplant patients we're seeing have more severe disease than, let's say, non-transplant patients uh, from the patients that you've, you know, you described and that you've uh, you've heard of. Yeah. Um, again, our experience, as I pointed out, is very, very limited, and and I'm very interested to hear what our Italian colleagues uh, are describing, which again is is very different than our very initial experience with just five patients. Um, some of the limiting factors, I think, that may go into the picture that I presented with the five cases that were summarized are that they were all patients who were distant, means a median of 15 years after transplant on low-dose immunosuppression. And despite having significant comorbidities so far with very limited follow-up, the patients have generally done well. And it at least raises the possibility based on what appears to be emerging from uh, pathogenesis work that perhaps the host response is as important as the virus in determining the course of disease. So could it be that despite having multiple risk factors for progressing or having very severe disease, that the very low dose maintenance immunosuppression that these patients were on in some way might have modulated the expression of disease? Highly speculative at this point, but I was surprised based on that, uh, again, very limited experience that none of the patients with seven days of follow-up, to be clear, have progressed to requiring intubation or progressed to death, as has been described in, in many people with those same comorbidities who are not necessarily receiving immunosuppression. But that's a fundamentally important aspect of uh, for all of us in transplant. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the other issue is that I wonder if we are missing patients that have atypical symptoms um, that maybe are not even getting tested. I, I don't know if you've um, had any any insight into that. I think in part our experience has um, reflected the availability of rapid real-time testing as one of the first centers in the U.S. to, to have that go live. Um, and we are finding a much broader range of illness, perhaps, than uh, was initially recognized and described in China. And so one possible explanation for our findings of, quote, relatively mild disease is perhaps related to a testing bias that our uh, prospective uh, testing recommendations and guidance that we've developed that are open for everyone to see uh, through the UW uh, COVID website are to test all immunosuppressed uh, patients, uh, solid organ transplant patients who meet any of the criteria in terms of symptoms. So perhaps that has led to identification of patients who in other locales might never have been tested. So I think the indications for testing is probably going to turn out to be an important um, uh, determinant of the, the expression or the recognized expression of, of COVID-19 in SOT. Great, thanks, Ajit. A uh, question for Paolo. Um, 
Paolo, there's been a lot of talk on using uh, hydroxychloroquine for uh, for treatment, for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, and for primary prophylaxis um, right after transplant. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on the side effects of hydroxychloroquine and what we need to do in terms of monitoring the patient for for adverse effects. So, <clears throat> thank you for your question. So, I don't think there is any evidence that uh, uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine can be of any benefit as prophylaxis. So, there is a lot of uh, uh, attention and many people are using this uh, approach, not just in transplant, but also in the general population. Many physicians in the emergency room are trying to use, but I just admitted a patient with a severe interstitial pneumonia due to SARS coronavirus 2, who was on uh, chloroquine treatment from a long time because of uh, a rheumatologic disease. So I'm not sure that is, I mean, it's just one case, so it's anecdotal, but I'm not sure that this is going to be of any benefit. And we are short of uh, hydroxychloroquine, that is the only drug available uh, in Italy, and uh, we are using uh, probably inappropriately. So I'm, I'm not sure that this is something that we should do. And in terms of, of side effects, uh, so we should be uh, careful for what is the potential uh, QT prolongation related to uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine uh, administration. So I, I'm not really convinced that this is the way to go to, to give everybody this drug. So there is a shortage of, of, of the drug. And, and in, in my personal experience, it didn't work at all as prophylactic agent uh, to prevent uh, uh, severe uh, uh, coronavirus disease. So that's my personal point of view based on a limited experience but uh, I, I would like to see some strong data to support this before uh, using uh, universally in all uh, recipients as prophylaxis great thanks paulo i think um you know, I'm glad you highlighted that, uh, you know, chlor this hydroxychloroquine is the supply may be limited. And also, you know, we really don't have a lot of evidence of using using it in infection or for prophylaxis. Um, just one last question for Attilio, if uh, you're still on the line. Um, you met, you talked about uh, immunosuppression withdrawal. Um, has there ever been any thought about actually uh, giving steroid bolus um, to patients who have severe pneumonitis in terms of reducing the inflammatory response. Um, it's, it's sort of difficult to know what to do if we should try to reduce the inflammatory response versus uh, withdraw immunosuppression to um, combat the virus. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on that, Atilio. Well, um, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Atilio. Okay. So in our experience um, with steroids, we have tried in very advanced patients and we didn't notice any substantial benefits. And, but uh, in a mild form uh, and maybe in moderate form, we have used steroids to reduce the other uh, dose of, for example, cyclosporin or tacrolimus. And um, we didn't notice any episode of rejections. So our standard protocol now is uh, to use steroid in a mild form, at least, and reduce as much as you can the immunosuppressing therapy. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, we don't have any evidence. And on uh, the other hand, when you treat advanced patients, I think uh, um, it's always, you have a lot of bias. So it's difficult to understand if steroids is really appropriate. Thank you. Okay, so in the interest of time, I think um, I just want to uh, say thank you to all of you, and I think we can move on to the next section. So thanks to Polly, and uh, this is Meryl Johnson, um, and actually we're going to go on now to 
some kind of less specific issues related to transplant, but how all of this actually interacts with what else is going on in our hospitals, um, at least for the first section of that. And I'll again um, tell about the speakers that will go in this section. We'll start out with Atul Humar, who's the Director of Transplant ID at the University Health Network in Toronto, who will kind of give us some information about how their center is dealing with this currently and also has some previous experience during the SARS epidemic. Um, I guess Luciano is listed again, I think, uh, primarily uh, to mention a link to the JAMA video, which I think I listened to and people should find very helpful. Interview with an editor of, of JAMA with uh, a, a colleague in Italy, um, Stacey Lorette, will, um, who is the tra uh, chief um, at, at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin down the road from me, will talk about managing patient and family concerns as well as medication supplies. And then finally, uh, Lou Tepperman, who is in the thick of things in New York, will talk about how we can actually um, uh, interact with and take care of our patients, uh, perhaps in a way without seeing them. So without further ado, I'll pass it to uh, Dr. Humar and uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Meryl, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Can... Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, management of the transplant program in the setting of a, of a pandemic. So next slide. So uh, a lot of the considerations we've talked specifically about so far have been around transplant patients and how to navigate donor and recipient management. But a lot of the planning, I think, will be driven by factors external to the transplant program. So in the context of a pandemic, uh, you know, heavy, heavy resource utilization, use of ICU beds, ventilators, and ward beds, with most estimates being about five ward, bed, ward patients admitted for every ICU patient, means really scaling back transplant activity is inevitable. And also for, for donors uh, with limited ICU capacity, uh, workup and identification of donors becomes more difficult as well. The other issue is high rates of healthcare worker absent, absenteeism is a, is a big problem. And then the final thing, which we've already talked about, I think is immunosuppressing otherwise stable patients during a pandemic. So at our own institution, we've developed a phase, a pr phased approach to transplant volume reductions. And I think this is necessary to try to conserve resources, but also to minimize waitlist impact for our patients. Next slide. So this is a, a table and this is a, a just published uh, today online actually as well. And it goes through different phases of reductions that transplant programs could consider all the way from a 25% reduction to a 50% reduction to all the way to 100% reduction. So in a 25% reduction phase, I think of this is when activity is just starting in your jurisdiction and you're doing the planning and you're, you're expecting the wave of patients to come. And there you could think about for kidney, for example, no live donor activity, but continued deceased donor activity. For, living, uh, for liver transplant, no living donor activity for stable recipients, but allow it for um, more advanced recipients and continued deceased donor activity. Continue heart and lung activity, but, uh, um, but pause on some of the pancreas transplant alone and, and pancreas after kidney activity. Then in the next phase is a 50% reduction, which I think most places in the US and many places in Canada are at that stage. And certainly many places in Europe, I feel are, are probably beyond that stage. Um, this is where you might consider transplant only for semi-urgent or urgent cases, uh, patients who really need the service. And so in that situation, you uh, would pause kidney transplant activity, both deceased donor and living donor activity, except the, with the potential option of highly sensitized patients who are unlikely to get another offer. You may restrict liver transplant activity to uh, only recipients who have MELDs above a certain category, and that's each jurisdiction has to decide that MELD cutoff. And similarly for heart, you may uh, restrict activity to intermediate status or higher patients. Uh, for lung activity, you could allow all patients in that setting still to go forward, but defer for very stable patients. And for kidney pancreas activity, you would generally pause except for high PRA as above. So next slide. 
Then as you get to, to, to a more severe situation where you're seeing a lot of ICU capacity being used up due to COVID, um, you would go into a 75% reduction mode. And here, uh, really, you would only be doing what are considered the, the very high need transplants. So liver transplant, kidney activity would be paused for the most part. Liver transplant would be for a very high mild or fulminant hepatic failure. Heart transplant would be um, high status only, and the status classification differs by, by country and jurisdiction. And lung transplant would be reserved for rapidly deteriorating patients. And then the final category is, of course, 100% reduction in transplant activity. And there are places that unfortunately are in this situation. And here, there's really no other IC, no ICU capacity available. There's severe shortages of health personnel, severe shortage of ventilators. And this, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, will likely lead to a halt of all living and deceased donor uh, transplant activity. And then I think there should be similar phased reductions occurring in ambulatory activity, the 25%, 50%, 75%, with deferral of non-essential visits and a really aggressive shift to virtual platforms for care. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. So I will stop there and thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight essential components of patient and family management. We all know and are certainly experiencing unprecedented demands on our time to care for patients and families. Next slide, please. And while the first thought that comes to mind is clinical care and how we're managing our patients in the hospital, it's equally important to consider how we're supporting patients and families while they're managing their transplant in the home environment. Specifically, the volume of calls that are coming through with questions and concerns um, to our transplant team is enormous. So knowledge of reliable transplant specific resources is critical to disseminate accurate information to patients and families. UNOS is one such valuable resource and you can see a picture of the UNOS webpage uh, that has COVID-19 highlighted. And UNOS has latest updates that are highlighted in yellow and updated frequently. And they also have links to some of the major Transplant Society websites that you can see on the right-hand side under Quick Links. And when you click on these major uh, society websites, they include American Journal of Transplantation, AST, AOPO. Uh, it goes directly to their COVID-19 section among within their website. So it's, easily, it's easy to access this information. There are also uh, links to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Specifically, there are multiple sections that you as a transplant team member can go to and reference uh, that include what you need to know, um, how you can share with your transplant families how to prepare their own family, and then frequently asked questions sections for healthcare professionals. We know also that access to medications is essential for our patients and their overall health. And we want to consider providing options for medications specifically that patients may or may not already be utilizing. 90-day medication supply might be one strategy that you could implement as a transplant program if you're currently uh, utilizing 30-day supply. Uh, you can increase that and also potentially medication delivery service if that happens to be available based on their uh, pharmacy. Both of these options are addressing the possible inability for transplant patients to get to the pharmacy to pick up their medications. Also as a team, we want to be as efficient as possible. With all of the education that we are providing to our inpatients uh, and in telehealth ambulatory visits, as well as over the phone, it's important to be able to document our conversations thoroughly but efficiently. And one way to do that is to create a shortcut uh, within your electronic medical record for the education that you provide. These shortcuts can be used for providers, nurses, and coordinators uh, for them to document uh, their time with patients and families. Next slide, please. You can also consider strategies to communicate with families without communicating with them in person or over the telephone. And one such strategy is to provide letters uh, or also uh, documents through your electronic health record. There are two types of letters that I wanna highlight here. Uh, there's specifically general letters 
providing information and education about COVID-19 for patients and their families, and then also letters for work uh, specifically for patients and or their caregivers to uh, be excused from their work or be afforded the opportunity to work from home. There are templates that are available at NACCO, which is the Organization for Transplant Professionals, and you can see the link here that you can use. Uh, and what these letters do is really provide a framework. Uh, you can edit these at uh, whatever to best suit your program. Additionally, there are two other organizations that I want to point to your attention, the American Nurses Association. Uh, there is a screenshot of one of the documents available through their organization on the upper right hand side. They provide colorful handouts that can be provided as an adjunct to the letter that you send in the mail or also can be uh, sent via electronic medical record, uh, the electronic health system. And some of the options that they have available to you are handouts titled What You Need to Know, What to Do If You're Sick, Guidelines to Prevent the Spread Within Your Home, and What Are Symptoms of uh, the Coronavirus Disease. Furthermore, the World Health Organization is another important resource to be familiar with. This has media resources that include press briefings, uh, as well as videos specifically geared to the public on how to protect yourself um, during the COVID-19 outbreak. There's also these Mythbusters section, and you can see one of the uh, pictures on the lower right-hand side. This one is specifically addressing the question, are antibiotics effective in preventing uh, the new coronavirus? These are free and available for download uh, and can be added into your letter uh, that you provide to patients and families. These are all resources that can be used in written com communication uh, or can also be used to inform your conversations with families to help them feel informed during this challenging time. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Lewis. Please continue. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Lou Teverman in New York. And uh, as Lloyd had told you, uh, it is true. Uh, there truly is, uh, a, a, uh, we haven't hit a peak yet. There are over 20,000 uh, individuals that have tested positive. We have 200 individuals in our hospitals right now, uh, in our main two hospitals with 60 uh, individuals in our ICU and we are repurposing our uh, employees. Uh, if you can give me the next slide. I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about uh, telemedicine, uh, which was uh, turned into telehealth. Uh, initially, telemedicine just referred to the physician and, and telehealth refers to all the healthcare providers um, and all the support staff that we can use. In, education and, and of course remote monitoring of our patients. Right now for our outpatient clinics in New York, 90% uh, of the visits have been, uh, they're no longer an inpatient and in-person visit and we're looking to telehealth to help us out. Telehealth initially was for care in the rural setting and then it was supposed to be used by the military for forward deployment and, and difficult to reach settings. And now, of course, we're using it for COVID. Uh, and it has been underutilized in our country and, and for disasters. It can manage the surge of patients and handle closure of outpatient offices, which is now happening in, throughout New York. Uh, it allows clinical experts to respond uh, without being there. This will be a test of our system. So, uh, Telehealth, for our Italians, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, it's all about who has control. It's HIPAA, HIPAA, uh, and, and I'll tell you the, the new caveats to this. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And there were real compliance changes in 2003 and that protected health information and they were linked to payment. And this is why telehealth has not really surged until March 6th when uh, our government said they, they lifted geographic restrictions and now private carriers and Medicaid, uh, we were allowed to bill for point-to-point -point physician care. And then the secretary expanded Medicare coverage for telehealth visits in September, excuse me, in March 17th. And uh, there's a link to this 
uh, in the uh, uh, documents uh, associated with this webinar that you can read for FAQs. And uh, so they waive potential HIPAA penalties for good faith efforts for telehealth, and uh, they looked at cost sharing for beneficiaries and reduced and waived them. And so essentially, this is a get out of jail card. Uh, get out of jail for free. If you make a good faith effort and you record your events with telehealth, uh, no one's going to come after you. So we have two main types uh, that you can use. Virtual private network, that is trying to make a tunnel. So imagine that you're going through a mountainside tunnel and no one can see inside you. Uh, that is uh, one very protected uh, area and that serves for a virtual private network. And instead of sharing the fiber traffic, it's totally protected. And you can notice these uh, to know if you're on a protected network when it starts off with HTTPS, and, and that's a secure address. The other way is what we're used to now is end-to-end -end encryption. So, uh, you know, your phone can work that way, uh, and uh, a WhatsApp will work that way. So on one side, it's encrypted, and the other side, the receiving end, it is unencrypted or decoded. So you can set up telehealth to one of your patients with one of the uh, programs that you can use and, and everyone's using different ones. It doesn't make a difference as long as they're protected. And send an SMS text, have your patient then press that, download the program, download the software, then make an appointment, connect to them, and then you can record this in the medical record and you're home free. Next slide, please. So what are we doing? Uh, there, there are many ways to do this. Uh, just to let you know, we are employing uh, Amwell, which is American Well, which uses the cloud for one of our concepts. Uh, and uh, we're using the surge uh, with these carts that you can see uh, to treat COVID-19 patients. Uh, you, you don't want to necessarily get in all the rooms. Uh, the one on the right is an EICU, our transplant ICU, which is the newest ICU in the Northwell system, is uh, EICU. So there are cameras and, and monitors and microphones throughout the rooms, and the patients can see you, you can see them. That unit has been turned into a COVID unit. It's 18 beds, it's all full. It's an uh, ICU and ventilator. Uh, and uh, so we're now having, we don't allow family visitors to the hospital at present. And so these uh, patients uh, can communicate to their loved ones through this, they can see them. And then we're also having to communicate end of life issues when family members are not allowed in the hospital. So telemedicine will help us succeed and will also help us in some of our doctor's hours. I do believe that this is going to be a marathon not a sprint, and I think this is an opportunity to use telehealth. Thank you very much. So thank you, Lloyd. I think that um, there's a, a lot of information that's coming through here, and I think that, you know, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I've been said that I have one question to really ask people, and I guess I will go back and um, really ask Dr. Humar, you know, you actually had those 50, 25, 70, 25, 50, 75, 100%, you know, where are you in Toronto now? And, you know, we can't predict the future, but, you know, how, how can we prepare best in our own centers um, to deal with the issues that are coming forward? Uh, so that's a good question. In Toronto, we're approximately at 50% or a little bit higher than that pause in activity. And, the current state in Toronto is that there's there's a fair amount of community transmission going on. We're starting to see patients admitted and some in our ICUs. So we've paused um, all kidney activity with the exception of high PRA. We're continuing liver, both deceased and living donor liver activity, but um, prioritizing it to the higher MELD patients. Um, for, for heart, we're... Um, Doing, doing higher status patients. Our lung program's a little bit unique in that, you know, we do 200 lung transplants a year and our ICU tends to be full of lung transplant patients. So we put a more severe pause on our lung program just to try to free up some ICU capacity in anticipation of a big surge. So we're only doing um, very rapidly deteriorating lung patients. 
Okay, thank you. And I guess the other thing I will say, because there, um, we don't have time to really go into it, but I will try to make sure that everybody that's on the call and in some of the materials has the link to the JAMA video, which I think is also very helpful in this regard. Um, and uh, with that, and in fact, it may, I don't know, they'll have to update me and see if that's actually on um, the um, resources that is actually on the link there. And the staff can probably provide that information. And with that, um, we'll go on to next steps. Stuart. Go ahead, Stuart. <clears throat> like he's unmuted. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Stuart. It looks like we can't we can't hear you. It's it, you appear to be unmuted. Um, but we're unable to hear you, unfortunately. Uh, try again, that? Stuart. Go on to Tim. If yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, can I have the first slide? This is actually a really interesting thing. So what do we need to know? The answer is everything. Um, there are two major domains that I think we need information on. And right now, when certainly in the s systems which are being overwhelmed, which is like what Lou was saying. We just need to know what we need to gather because, and we can accumulate it after the fact, but we need to gather the basics. We, and the basics are twofold. One is the course of the disease, and the other is transplant specific uh, issues that we need to go. You saw a little bit of things earlier in terms of the Washington experience regarding what kind of transplant patients were there, but we clearly need to know the differences in outcomes by type of, of uh, transplant recipient coming forward, lung versus probably everybody else, but we don't know. Uh, the time from transplant, the duration and degree of viral shedding or viremia, and in particular, because we've had so much experience with RNA viruses in the past, does immunosuppression prolong either viral uh, amounts and, um, and, and potential transmission of disease or shedding and clearance afterwards. It, preliminary stuff looks like it doesn't matter, but I think if we can get any type of information, it would be remarkably um, important. The other thing is the impact of immunosuppression changes on the course. Do Are we going to see any um, rebound infections, induction of um, antibody-mediated immunity or rejection? Uh, what is this gonna, what's actually gonna happen? And the, the very, important thing is going to be um, for those of us who continue to transplant will the COVID-9 acquisition uh, early after induction immunosuppression alter the clinical infection there just haven't been all that many done so as we move forward the transplant programs we all need to keep track of this and uh, what type of immunosuppression we use uh, whether we use depletional and drugs or non-depletion is going to be pretty key. Um, the organ availability in donors has been talked about a lot. We do need to make sure that we keep track of what happens to our live donors, that in fact they are okay. We need to know whether there's hospital acquired infections or community acquired infections in this population that's potentially induced by um, uh, uh, surgical procedures and certainly deceased donor organs. We we just need to know whether there's a risk with the donor and the demographics. The treatment is going to be one, whatever comes out with the treatments, whether it's the um, antivirals, the anti-IL-6, the anti-modulators, the anti-malarials, they're going to be done under some sort of IRB. The transplant specific components will not be part of the standard subset analysis, and we need to know who we have going forward, um, which goes on it. And with the rise of the use of vaccines, which is something we obviously need, we're gonna to have to have uh, an understanding of what the impact of our immunosuppressive regimens are on, on antibody generation and efficacy as well as titers. There are just a ton of, of transplant specific things that we are going to need to know that we, are, we need to, as the protect practitioners on the transplant side, make sure we collect this data so that it can be put together 
into some sort of meaningful accumulation at the end that we can make sense of. The next uh, uh, piece, next slide. The other domain that we really need to know is sort of what's been going on with the transplant specific capacity to provide specialized transplant care. Will it break down and when does it break down? Um, as Lou is talking about, the transplant specific providers will be repurposed to other places and what's going to be the consequence on our patients and our programs. Um, and it, as Atul was mentioning, some we're, there's a varying phase of performance or non-performance um, in terms of what goes on after the fact gets done. Understanding what we've done in terms of rate limiting issues, um, either self-inflicted or resource external inflicted, we're going to need to have some sort of um, uh, analysis and understanding. Um, the one which I'm actually quite concerned about is the uh, impact on transplant healthcare uh, workers or professionals, uh, the number that are too sick to uh, care for other people. Um, I think the, the guys in Italy have, under, have seen this happen. There's a, a fair bit of uh, literature on that, and we're a pretty small uh, population of, of people. And if we go out, and how many of us do go out uh, for infection or isolation, how's that in, going to impact? existing transplant recipients or the ability to provide care. Um, I think we need to understand a lot of this. We need to keep track of it inside of our own systems, either through administration or through um, um, uh, the, the, our coordinators just to keep, keep an issue because when it's all said and done, we're gonna need to understand the impact of, of what a, a major system breakdown does to our patients. And I think that's it for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can, Stuart. Thank you so much. Terrific. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Ashley Morgan speaking on behalf of AJT. Dr. Kirk is apparently not available, unfortunately. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, my name is Ashley Morgan, and I'm uh, the managing editor at AJT. Uh, we wanted to let you know what we are doing to support the community during this pandemic. Um, we are accelerating review for all COVID-19 manuscripts. Um, you can see our, our manuscript types, word limits, reference limits here for submissions. Further instructions are at amjtransplant.com slash instructions. Uh, next slide, please. And we are reviewing all formats all articles are going to be free to access for everyone um, in the interest of facilitating patient care and advancing science and ensuring that accurate knowledge and experience is available to all during this current time of crisis. We are expediting papers, as I said before, and um, they will be free access. And they are all collected in one place for easy access at amjtransplant.com slash COVID-19. That is updated usually daily, um, depending on what we have to, what we have published and what we have ready uh, for readers. And that's it for me. Thanks very much, Ashley. And I'll just comment that, um, what you're doing in AJT is being mirrored by other transplant-related journals. I do know that the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant is also working to get COVID-related uh, uh, manuscripts reviewed quickly and, and like the ones that are accepted posted quickly. There is a separate website there as well. I don't know if there's, there's other specifics, um, but perhaps we can gather that information from other journals as well. Um, if we have time for one other question, uh, I guess I would ask Tim, um, recognizing that the uh, the data is changing so quickly, uh, how do we understand as a community the data that's coming out here in terms of small uncontrolled studies, and how do we how do we leverage the bits and pieces coming from everywhere uh, to gather information that turns out meaningfully? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really difficult thing to address, Stuart, because we all have our own individual perspectives. We just did an I, um, a liver transplant society meeting with um, this morning with lots of different folks from around the world. And everybody has small numbers, which are 
really statistically insignificant by themselves, insignificant by themselves. But the the necessity of collating this data is real. Now, whether we can do it through a a national system, um, such as through UNOS, and to set up formal data fields moving forward with you know certain boxes and ranges of 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 of, of elements that we want to look at. I'm, I'm not sure what's available. I don't think we've ever confronted this type of thing before. I, the societies may be able to to help arrange it uh, either the, through the AST or the ASTS. Um, and it we are just in, in new turf. But, but unless we at least accumulate important issues regarding the what we see, and the sequential nature of what we do in transplant, which we all do. I mean, everybody's participated in some form of a trial somewhere, I would think, in which we look at immunosuppression and clinical outcomes and, and all the different infectious-related issues. We can, without prospectively doing it now, we can all sort of keep track of some of that data and eventually, at the end, come up with something which may not be clean, but will at least help us help guide us towards the future. Thanks, Tim. I guess I'll just make two comments. First of all, I think the group in Seattle is is trying to do some of that collection through a yep. local database. And I would encourage all of you to, to look at that. The second is uh, both, both AST and ISHLT, and I'm sure there are others, have very active message boards where people are sharing their experience yep. and answering and asking each other questions. I think those boards could also be used for collecting uh, some of the anecdotal experience, and and we at ISHLT are thinking about how to do that. I suspect that that Emily and her group at AST are doing that as well. And in the in the short run, using those places may be uh, as quick and easy a way of gathering information as we can get. Thank you, Stuart. Um, this is Emily Blumberg again. Um, I'd like to also mention that I know there's a European group, the Increment Group, that is also collecting data. This this webinar has been our first attempt to really have a multi-society outreach to try to help us all deal with a, what in an extraordinary circumstance. We're very interested in learning what you all thought of this. We want to be here as an international collaborative to help, whether that means collaborating on research studies so that we don't have these pockets of research that are sort of disconnected but can somehow be integrated, or whether it's to create additional webinars. We're thinking of actually doing some modules that might be able to be accessed in shorter bites that might be accurate and helpful to people um, when they need them, especially because we feel that this is such a rapidly changing landscape that we want to make sure that we are current for everybody. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, we will have this webinar available through all society websites. And if there's a society you're a member of that you think would be interested in that, please let the organizers of this know, um, and you can just respond to your specific invitation, or you can email me via AST um, as well. Additionally, we will have all of these resources available as a handout, and it will be posted after the recording of this call is completed with links to all the web pages. And we are working very, um, actively to make sure all of our resources and those of other societies are up to date. And so the best thing to do is to keep using those links, which will keep you updated. You guys have all been very patient and I noticed that many people are still here. In order for us to best serve you moving forward, I'm gonna ask your patience for one more minute to just answer two polls, the two questions on a poll. This will literally take less than a minute and so we're just going to ask you two questions, whether you found this to be helpful. And we'll give you a minute to just vote there. And then our second question for you oops, is coming, we, I think. Yep, we just whether have to switch it. 
you would be interested in participating or viewing future updates to this webinar. If you have other things that you think would be very useful for us to be working on as a collaborative group of societies, please email the individuals in your own society who are involved in this, and that will be on the resource page too, um, so that we can know how best to serve you moving forward. We are definitely interested in trying our best to really provide people with things that will allow us to all serve our patients to the best of our abilities moving forward, benefiting from each other's experience and knowledge. Um, I'd like to thank all of the presenters and our moderators and the organizing committee for what's been a lot of work in a very short period of time. Please continue to take care of yourselves, be well, and many thanks for your attention and also to the organizers, the staff people, Brian Valeria and Erica Ng, especially for helping coordinate this webinar. So thanks very much.